Functions trigonometry, final exam review, video number six. Let's pick up with problem number 34. Uh, we need to come up with the standard form of the equation for the given ellipse. Okay, the first thing that we need to come up with is we need to get the dimensions of the major and the minor axis. All right, well, half this major axis is five units and half this major axis is two units. All right, well, the major axis, that is going to be our variable A, our dimension A. The minor axis, or half the minor axis, then is going to be B. All right, and then we know our equation involves an A squared and a B squared, so we go ahead and do that. Okay, so this is going to be our A squared, and that is going to be our B squared. And we know those go into the denominator, the standard equation, but where do I put the a squared? Where I put the b squared, and I have these backwards. a squared, b squared. In the ellipse, the a squared is always the big guy. The b squared is always the little guy. All right, so where do I put the big one? Where do I put the a squared? Well, I look at the orientation of the ellipse. The orientation is vertical. Well, what is our vertical term? The x or the y? The y is our vertical term. So that is where the a squared belongs. Okay, so if this was a horizontal, then I would put the a squared term underneath the x variable. Okay, so by default, then there's where the b term goes. All right, it's kind of like think of uh, which is, is, the par is the major axis parallel to the y-axis or is the major axis parallel to the x-axis, and that will help you decide where a squared goes. All right, so um, we can see that it is oriented on the origin, so h and k then are zero, and so we can pretty this equation up a little bit, and there's our equation for this ellipse. And it says, what is the length of the foci? The length of the foci is the, from the center uh, along the major axis to the focus. All right, It'll be somewhere short of the vertex. And for an ellipse, the relationship between the dimensions a, b, and c is given by this equation. I know b squared, a squared, all right, c. Uh, put that in. So where are the um, coordinates for the foci? It's along the major axis. Zero comma positive root 21, which is about 4.6, right? So just shy of the vertex. If you get a coordinate that's past the vertex, you did something wrong. And then the other foci is down here at zero comma negative root 21. Okay, the next problem is a graphing problem. You know, a lot of times students will just put this in your calculator and then match the picture. All right, you're not always going to be able to get away with that. One of the um, key learning points of functions in trigonometry is that you know the graphs of all of the trig functions, sine, cosine, and tangent, and their inverses secant, cosecant, and cotangent. So that's a skill that we want you to come away with this class with. You're going to need it for pre-cal and calculus. So we don't want you to just have a skill of pressing buttons on the calculator. Now the sine and cosine functions are fairly easy. We have uh, t tables for those and then we can apply our translations. Now the way I taught you to do the tangent function is not by a t table but by locating asymptotes. Okay, for just the regular tangent function, the parent function of tangent, the asymptotes lie at, uh, the first set of asymptotes lie at negative pi over two to positive pi over two. Well, I can see by my translations here, I have a horizontal shift uh, to the left. So what is that going to do? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace this with my expression here for x, and then I'm going to isolate the x variable. All right, so that means I need to subtract negative pi from all three places in the equation, and this, uh, these asymptotes have now been shifted 
pi units to the left. All right, now I'm ready to locate these asymptotes on my graph. All right, there's negative 3 pi over 2 to pi over 2, and then I just continue this for a few periods. And once you've got these asymptotes laid in, then the rest is pretty easy. Now, what I want you to do next is I want you to come to the midpoint between each asymptotes and plot a point. Those are your zeros. All right, the function will cross the x-axis at that point. Okay, the next thing uh, I need you to do is if you come a quarter of the way across the period, you plot your negative point. You come three quarters of the way across the period, you plot your positive point, and then connect it with like a lazy S shape. All right, that is for the tangent function, but we notice that we have a um, x-axis reflection because this coefficient is negative. So what is that going to do to my points? Well, this negative point is going to become a positive. All right, this positive point is going to be negative. It's going to reflect it and actually ends up looking like the cotangent function. And before I move on, let me talk about where did this positive one and where did this negative one come from? That comes from the coefficient, the lead coefficient of the tangent function, which is, in this case, is negative 1. Okay, so I can continue to repeat this pattern, and then I have my tangent function with my translation, and that matches then this graph shown in A. Okay, so... I do believe that finishes up the calculator portion. Let's go to the non-calculator portion. Let's see what we've got here. Question one of the non-calculator. Talking about uh, multiplicities. Okay, so I have this equation. Okay, what are my zeros? Well, this should be fairly uh, obvious because it's been factored for me. I'm going to have a zero at positive 7, negative a quarter. Right, now I look at these exponents. What, what does this um, 7 minus x to the fifth mean? Well, that means this term is repeated five times. One, two, three, four, five. It occurs five times. So positive 7 as a root occurs five times. Five is an odd number. Okay, If my occurrence or my multiplicity is odd, it will cross the x-axis. Okay, now what about this guy here? It appears four times. It has a multiplicity of four. What's the big deal about that? It's not so much the four, it's the fact that four is an even number. So that will be what we call a touch and turn. All right, so this has uh, a multiplicity of five, and it will cross. This has a multiplicity of four. It will touch and turn. Okay, some of these are gimmies. Sine of 4 pi over 3. Well, I look at my unit circle, and I find the y-coordinate of 4 pi over 3. And where's 4 pi over 3? Down here. What's the y-coordinate? Here. Verify a smart trig class. Okay, yeah, sine should be negative in this quadrant. And I just read it off the unit circle. And there you go. If you don't know your unit circle... You're wrong. Go fix yourself. Make sure you have that down pat. Do not try to get out of functions trig without knowing that unit circle like the back of your hand. All right, um, reference angle. Well, what is a reference angle? A reference angle is that angle to the x-axis. It doesn't matter if you're above the x-axis, below the x-axis, uh, negative x-axis, positive x-axis, what is your angle to the axis? Like, for instance, okay, what do we got here? Uh, we got 570. Well, the first thing I need to know is I need to get a coterminal angle on that. Okay, that's 210 degrees or 7 pi radians. Okay, now let's go to our unit circle. See where 7, um, 7, pi over six, 7 pi over 6 radians is. Okay, it's right here. Okay, now here I've got two angles. This is an angle. This is an angle. 
This is an angle made with the y-axis. Don't care. This is an angle made with the x-axis. I do care. What is the magnitude of that angle? It's pi over 6. That is your reference angle. Okay, now it goes on to say, well, what is the tangent of 7 pi over 6? Well, remember, this represents the cosine. This represents the sine. And the tangent of an angle is the sine divided by the cosine. So this guy divided by this guy is going to give me tangent, a smart trig. Uh, so I know my tangent in this quadrant is going to be positive. All right, so the rest is just uh, divide fractions, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, rationalized denominators, and then I get that. Okay, um, this is getting a little long, but I'm going to squeeze it in because I want to get done. Nope. I need to talk about, well, I'm talking about inverse functions. Okay, I'll pick that up in video number seven.